That's good. You may. That's good. Good morning, Father. We just pray that you would fill us with your spirit and we would continue that hallelujah as we open your word and make much of your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, you may be seated. Wow. Come on. I don't know what you're ready for today. But I believe the Lord is going to meet us in a special way. And I want to start off with a question. What if? What if there was more? What if there was more to this life right now than we've been experiencing? I'm talking both to the, to the believer in Christ, to those who are seeking to find out more about Christ, to those who are upset that they're here this morning, to those who are uh, bitter about who God is, all are welcome, and all are invited to explore this question, what if there was more? Because I believe the Lord wants to meet us in that question today. What if there was more of God's presence, of God's promises, and of God's power for us to experience like, like today? What, what, if, what if there was more than we've been walking in? What if, we, what if we saw God do more stuff around us? You know, we've been, we've been talking about this series that we've been in called Greater Works, Greater Expectations, and it's, you know, Jesus made this promise that, that we're going to do the same things that he did and even greater things, and it's because he's given us his Holy Spirit, and, and we're, we've been looking at, well, what is... What, is that, what does that mean, and what are some of the things that go along with that? And, and the premise of this series is that if we're going to see greater works in our time, we're going to have to have greater expectations of who God is, because God does his best work in community, but in community of faith. And so my thought today is that, well, if we started to see God do more stuff in our own personal lives and in our community together then the likelihood of us having raised expectations for who God is and what he could do would grow. Are you with me on that? Okay, so, so if, if God started doing more stuff and we started to see more of the power of God, we would probably, as a natural re response to that, have greater expectations for who he is. So what if? What if there was more to be experienced? What if the... What if the kingdom of God was like a lot less chatter and a lot more change? Like a lot less talk and a lot more power and victory and experience. Well, I've, I've got good news for you. Check this out. Check out what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk but in what? Power. Power. Well, you're in the right place if you're a what-if type of person. Paul wrote this in the context of the church in Corinth. He was going back and forth with them. He was, uh, he was getting a little bit uh, choppy. He was getting a little bit dicey between the two of them, and they were starting to talk some smack, and, and they, you know, it was, it was kind of going back and forth, and, um, you know, it was kind of like, they weren't exactly sure what Paul was going to do. And it wasn't a great scene. And, and Paul, he writes to them and he's like, listen, like the kingdom of God, it's not about chatter. It's about change. It's about power. It's about what God demonstrates. There's, there's power in the kingdom of God. There's power in the person of Jesus. And in our, in our premise today is what if we had more access to that power than maybe we've ever realized? Like, like how would that potentially change things, especially how would that change things with our thoughts of, of expecting God to be awesome? Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be uh, primarily in, in Romans as we, as we kind of work through a few passages. We're going to see a couple of different places, so if you want to just go ahead and, and, and get to Romans 8 as we set that up, there, we're going we're gonna to 
take a look at a, at a bunch of different passages today, but that's going to be kind of where we're camping out, and, and we're in this series, like I mentioned, Greater Works, Greater Expectations. And it's all part of Vision 2020 where we're looking at, man, what if we were to see the number of Christ followers double uh, in our time? And, uh, and for us, what if we were to see like 200 people get baptized over the next uh, two years and, and 300 ma- people join the church and become a part of this family? And if we're going to see those greater works, man, man we've got to have greater expectations. At least that's the premise. And so we've been asking ourselves the question, uh, what are some of the traits of people who have these um, greater expectations? Well, there are people who live with confidence. There are people who live with great perseverance. Uh, people who live in intimate proximity to Jesus. These are people who live with uh, preparation. They, they seek the Lord as part of their preparation. And today, we're going to talk about power. That if you're going to be a person who has greater expectations, if, if you're going to be a person who's growing in your expectations of who God is and what he can do, well, well power's got to be kind of part of your thing. Like, you got to see some power in your life, or else you're always going to be hearing about a God of power and never experiencing a, a God of power. That, that's, a, that's a big stretch to think that you're going to grow in greater expectations if you actually never experience the power of God. Are you with me on that? So, so the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it can't always be just this thing that you study as though it were a topic. It's got to show up in your life and your community too. The two actually work together. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the fact that that, that, power, that power is something that is very available and accessible to us. Greater works, greater expectation. Well, let's talk a little bit about the idea of power. <clears throat> For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. The word power in the Greek is dunamē, dunamē, And it means miraculous power, might, or strength. So we're not talking about um, a power that you conjure up. This is not going to be a pep rally sermon that says you got to get stronger and you got to get better, you got to get faster. This is not about you can. This is about God can. This is about God loves to. And this is about let's trust him to do that. It's a miraculous power. So if you haven't come to the end of yourself and realized that you do not have miraculous powers in and of yourself, let me be the first to invite you to quit on yourself. It is a great place to stop. I mean, you've, you've got some potential to do some cool things. Like, you've got some abilities to do. But, like, when it comes to miraculous power, when it comes to the dunamé that the scriptures are talking about, we don't have that. It's a power outside of us. Miraculous strength, ability. It's an ability to perform, but it's power through God's ability. And what we're going to look at today is what kind of power do we have through God's ability. So uh, it's a little bit countercultural because a lot of times our culture will tell us to focus on what kind of power we have through our own ability. Get to know yourself better. Lean into your, your own sort of like unique design. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, getting to know yourself better. As a matter of fact, onboarding class two, it, it helps you to get to know some of your gifting and things like that better. But, but not so that you can lean into your own power, but so that you can see how the power of God lives within you so that you might serve him and and love others like never before. Miraculous power. It's actually, this word is used 120 times in the New Testament. So don't think this is like a one-off by Paul. The idea that we're supposed to live with power is a really big deal. And I don't know about you, but somehow, I've been a Christian for, I got saved when I was 13 years old, surrendered my life to Christ and started following him. But, but there was, there's something that I, I think maybe, I don't know if I missed the class on power or I missed all 120 mentions in the New Testament, but it, like living with power, leaning into power, um, walking in the power of the Lord, these are things that I'm still learning as though I was like uh, in 101 rookie class. Um, you know, I, I told the onboarding class last week, and if, you, if you've never been to onboarding, this is week two, jump in. It's a per- per- perfect time to do it. 
I told them last week, I've lived uh, a lot of my Christian life, it seems, under the influence of forgiveness, but not necessarily freedom. Oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm supposed to be experiencing God's power in ways that, that I haven't accessed before. And as I learn to access those ways, it will lead not just to my forgiveness, which I already have in Christ, but also some of the freedom which he loves to give his children so that they can give it to others. 120 times dunamé, power, not your power, but power that is made available to you. If you look at the life of Christ, he's, he's using dunamé, he's using power to heal people, to push back evil, to bring new things to life. Lazarus, he brings him back from the dead. Jesus was very familiar with power. See, the thing about power is that it's always connected to love. This isn't power for power's sake. I think it's Tim Keller who writes, power is not something that we run away from or run to. But when we experience power, we learn how to steward it and use it for the flourishing of others. I love that gospel perspective on power. I don't need to be afraid of it, nor do I need to like be obsessed with it. But what I need to do is learn, like Christ, how to use it to love others and to love God. So how about a list? You guys like lists? Check out this list. Um, this is a power list, all right? We're going to do a little power lift on this power list. And uh, it's, it's from Forbes.com. Henry Kissinger, former, state of, uh, former secretary of the state, compiled this list of the seven most popular people in history. Okay? And so here's his list, right? You got Julius Caesar. Okay? Uh, you got Chin Shi Wong. I looked up how to say it. Um, I'm not lying. <laughs> I did. I uh, got Peter the Great. I knew how to say that one. You got Gandhi. You got Napoleon. Teddy. And then the American president since 1945. Seven most, po uh, not popular, most powerful people in history, according to Forbes.com and Henry Kissinger. And I mean, like, where's our man Jesus, right? <laughs> like, I, we, you, could make a, you could make a case for the greatness of, of all of these, but check out this next slide. When we look at Jesus, none of the people in that list exhibited the power that Jesus had over these three areas, over the flesh, over the ways of the world, and over our great enemy. Every single one of those people on that list would fall victim to each of these three areas, whereas Jesus exhibited great power over each of these areas. First of all, the flesh. In Hebrews 4, 15, 16. Uh, uh, if they're not on your outline, make sure you, you jot these down. You're going you're gonna to want to take, take a look at these. Uh, this is where uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our great high priest, and he's been tempted in every way, yet was without what? Sin. Yet was without sin. So first, let's just make a case for the power of Jesus. And, and so here's the deal. He's been tempted in every way. He knows every single one of your temptations. He understands the flavor of the ones even that you don't want to share. The ones that are not socially acceptable. The ones that continue to haunt you in the night. The ones that have crippled you for years. Jesus understands the temptations of the human heart, and yet was without sin. So first we have to understand that Jesus has duname. He has this miraculous power over, over the flesh, over, over sin. Second, Jesus has miraculous power over the ways of the world. See, these are our three, these are sort of our, our three issues, if you will, uh, for the Christian. We've got the issue with the flesh, and that's sin. We've got the issue with the ways of the world, and we get the issue with an enemy that we have. Jesus exhibits power over the ways of the world. In Matthew 20, we see that Jesus talks about power, and he's like, hey guys, listen, 
We're not going to do it like the Gentiles do it. We're not going to lord power over people. We're, we're going to serve. Our, our greatness is going to be through service. And so we see that Jesus has miraculous power over the culture of the world, over the ways of the world. He's not sucked in like you and I are. He's not, he doesn't immediately gravitate towards the way that the world does things. He's very countercultural. He's got power over the culture of this world. It doesn't define him. And then lastly, he's got power over the enemy. In Mark 1, we, we see that Jesus um, cleanses or, or exercises uh, an unclean spirit or a demonic spirit from this guy who comes in uh, to, I believe it's the, the synagogue. And um, the, the comment uh, at the end is that, man, there's a new teaching and it's got authority. Even the unclean spirits obey him. And so we see that Jesus has power not only over sin and, and flesh, he's got power not only over the ways of the world and offers something better, but he's got power over our enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. You may not know this. You might be an early believer. Um, you might be new to the Christian faith. You might not understand uh, this concept in the Christian faith. Or you may have been a Christian for a while. And this is just something that you don't pay a lot of attention to. But we have an enemy. We have an enemy. And even though our flesh is sinful and our heart is wicked, the enemy is someone different. The enemy has at his heart a desire to steal, kill, and destroy you. And he is relentless at that pursuit, both before you know Christ and after you know Christ, and as you grow in Christ. I've heard people say that the target on your back grows in somewhat of correspondence with the growth of your faith. That if you want to see yourself become more important to the enemy, then that will be in correspondence to as you become more useful to the king of kings. The reason I say this is because sometimes, um, we're going to get into this here in just a minute, sometimes when it comes to the enemy, we have this, this temptation either to, to pretend like he doesn't exist as though he was um, like something out of a Tom and Jerry cartoon with like a pitchfork and, and you know, like all, you just kind of camp out, you put him in like the cartoon type era. Or we can overemphasize and like everything's a, of the enemy, you know, like, like every last flat tire is like the enemy, you know, like <laughs> we, can, we can go to extremes. Um, and, and both of those things are not a good place to live. A good place to live is, is with a very keen awareness of the fact that you have an enemy who would love to destroy you, but Jesus has exhibited power over that enemy. Amen. Now, that's going to um, become important to you the more we, the more we look at uh, this idea that we're going to flesh out today. Check out this, this kind of final verse on the authority of Jesus. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Can you go back to the front of that verse, the first slide in that verse, please, Richard? And Jesus came and said to them, how much authority? How much authority? All authority, all authority has been given. All authority has been given to Christ. All authority, all power has been given to Christ. And look at how he chooses to use his power by sending us to go and make disciples. And if for any reason you are here and you are doubting the all authority duname power of Jesus Christ, let me remind you that this little church called the Avenue Church baptized 17 people yesterday. If you are here and you were baptized, stand up. 
If you are here and you were baptized, stand up. Welcome to your new family. Welcome to your new family. Lest you forget power. Power. Ask anyone who stood up about maybe where they were six months ago, a year ago, and see if they can't explain to you how the power of miraculous God stole them away from where their life was headed. Just ask. You forget that all power and authority has been given to Christ. He has it all, and we are reminded on a constant basis when we see the gospel go forward and bring dead people to life. Guys, I think that um, it's important for us to realize this power is closer than we think. This power is closer than we think, and I think at times experience. And I believe the Lord wants to maybe challenge us in that today. So, so here's, the, uh, here's the invitation. Like, I know that Jesus came and died for our sin, so a holy God who shouldn't be with sinful people like me and you could pour out his wrath on somebody else and forgive us. Like, I know that Jesus came to do that. And he overcame our sin and death because there's, there's no body left. We can't find a body. And uh, he showed himself to his disciples. He, like, was resurrected. He overcame the sin and death. Like, I know that happened. And I, and I know that um, by putting our faith in Christ, by, by turning from all of our other efforts to be saved, whether by being good or whatever, whatever kind of crazy idea we think that we could be made right with a holy God, when we quit on that and just trust in Christ and Christ alone, turn from our sin and our, our chaos and we're like, Jesus, you're it. When we come to a place of surrender where he becomes our Lord by faith, our treasure, our savior. When we come to that place, I know that he forgives us of our sin, and I know that Jesus came to do that. If you've never done that, I invite you to do that even today. You just surrender your, your life to Christ and to his sacrifice on your behalf and to his lordship, simply just by faith and quitting on yourself and saying yes to Christ. I know that he came to do that. I know that he's coming again. I know that he's coming again to make all things right. I know, I know that's happening. And, and when he comes again, he's going to come again in power. And um, those, three, those three things that plague us, the flesh, the ways of the world, and our, our enemy, they'll, they'll be gone forever. I know that he's coming to do that uh, one day. But I also know that Jesus is here right now. I also know that he is, through the power of his Holy Spirit, come to be with us and dwell within us. And so, so, so here's the deal. Christ has come. Christ will come again, but Christ is here through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so the invitation I believe that God wants you to hear today is that today is the day. Today is the day. Say that with me. Today is the day. Today is the day for you to begin to experience a greater measure of this power than you ever have before. That's somewhat of a dangerous invitation. The enemy hates that we're about to break down how that might look in your life. So be prepared for whatever distraction or, or sort of... Um, detour might come into your mind right now and stay with me. Lean in. Lean in. I can even feel it on my own sense. Lean in. Check out these verses that invite us into this power. 
Now remember, Jesus is the one who has how much authority? All authority. He's got all the dunamis that we could ever need over anything that we could ever face. Well, let's check this out. I'm just curious. Where is Jesus? But if Christ is in you, through the, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Hold on right there. If Christ is where? In you. If Christ is in you. So we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father because he's overcome sin and death. But we also know that he has come to live within the believer through the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's very important that you know where Christ is because if he's the one who holds all power, if he's the one who holds all authority and he lives in you, check that out. There's access. There's dunamé. There's miraculous power that lives within you that you may have never realized before. It's not just forgiveness, it's freedom, it's power, it's victory, amen? amen. But if Christ is where? Yes. Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Next slide, please. But when it pleased God to reveal his son, where? Yes. In me, in me. Paul writes the book of Galatians, and it's a big book about faith and not works and things like that. And one of the things that he tells the church is that when, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me, where is the son? The son with all the power is in me. Next verse. I am crucified with Christ, again in Galatians. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives where? In me. Not just with me, not just supporting me, not just going in front of me and fighting my battles and not just going behind me and erasing my past and not just um, next to me as my companion, although all those things are true but he lives in me. The one who has power over sin, the one who has power over the enemy, the one who has power over the ways of the world lives in me. Next verse. Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. Where is he? In you. This is huge, guys. This is huge. The duname is not some concept that gives us hope for tomorrow, although it is. The duname is not some concept which gives us hope for forgiveness although it does. The dunamé is here in you through the person of Christ. Next verse. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. I in you. This concept of Christ in you is transformative. And the enemy would love for you to live unaware of the truth of it and without being able to access the experience of it. But not today, Satan. Sorry. Not today, because today is the day. Today is the day. Check this out. Go to the next slide, please. Romans 8 is where we said that we were going to kind of flesh this out and um, see, the, see the ramifications of it, if you will. 
So if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 8. And uh, we're going we're gonna to read through this and see what the Lord has to say to us about maybe accessing this more than we ever have before. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh please God. I'm going to go ahead and read the next verse. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So it is a, a prerequisite. It is, a, it is a, a foregone conclusion that if you are in Christ, if you have said yes to Jesus, then God has sent His Holy Spirit to live within you. That all those promises of Christ in you are true. You get the Holy Spirit. It's, it's part of your inheritance. So those of you who have surrendered your life to Christ, you said, yes, Jesus, by faith, you are my Savior, my treasure, my Lord. The Holy Spirit has come to live within you. Now these promises are true for you. And I couldn't help but as I was reading um, this passage, just this, this idea, could you go back um, a verse? Yeah. This, yeah, perfect. This concept for to set the mind it just kept showing up over and over again for to set the mind, for to set the mind. Next slide. We'll see it again, I think. Yep. The mind that is set. Let's see if it's one more time. Keep going. Next slide, please. Per oh, all right, that's good. <laughs> I got to move on anyways. Come on, kid. Let's go. <laughs> the idea is like, hey, setting the mind is like a huge deal. It's a huge deal. As a matter of fact, it seems like from what I read, both in the scripture and from what I read in outside sources, that like for us to begin to experience some of the power that actually already lives and dwells within us, it, it's going to start here. Like, like the battle for that is here. We talk a lot about the heart, but today we're going to talk about the mind, okay? We're going to talk about the mind because there's a lot that happens here that affects everything else. So today is the day, right? You've got that on your outline. There's a couple of blanks that we're going to look at right now. Today is the day. Today is the day to engage the battle. Blank number one. To engage the battle. To engage the battle with your flesh, to engage the battle with the ways of the world around you, to engage the battle with the enemy. The scripture is clear that our battle is in the unseen realms. You might think your battle is with your fill in the blank, your boss, your son, your neighbor, but the, the unseen battle the battle that is behind the veneer of this world and into the next is really where we win and lose. The scriptures tell us that, that that's where our battle is. It's, it's in the unseen places. And so, uh, just as a, as a point of clarity, I think it's important for like step one, if you will, not that these are necessarily in any kind of order, but like engage the battle. So, so if we're going to be uh, people who experience greater power and thus greater expectations, we're going to have to quit living as though we are in peacetime. This is not peacetime. The enemy would love for you to think that you are at peace 
and that any disruption to that peace is like an interruption to what should be. We, we are not in the full shalom of God. That is coming. We are at war right now. Our flesh hates what the Spirit is doing. The ways of the world do not agree with what the Spirit is doing. And we have an enemy who hates the power and what the Spirit is doing within us. Understand that at every step we are at war and it is a grave mistake to think that you are at the country club beach side when the enemy continues to pick you off every single day. Some of you maybe don't understand why family's not different or why I keep going back to my addiction or why is it that I can't get a hold of my anger. You are at war. You cannot handle wartime efforts with peacetime comforts. The scripture has a cure, if you will, for the, for the war that we're in. The New Testament says, put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. It's in Ephesians 6. You need to read it this week. I don't have time to work all the way through it, but here are some of the elements of what it means to put on the, the full armor of God. It means to have an emphasis on faith in Christ, to have an emphasis on his righteousness, to have an emphasis on the gospel and to have an emphasis on the word, the word, the truth. Those are the weapons by which we can engage this warfare. But you won't engage warfare unless you realize that you are at war. Number two, today is the day to realize the power is within you. The power is within you. A good friend of mine, Tommy Kiedis, used to say, um, leaders, quit living small. Quit living small. It's like to know glory to God when you live small. Sometimes we maybe think it's humble to like live small, be like, well, I, you know, I can't, uh, you know, like I shouldn't, I'm, like, I'm just me. Did you forget who lives in you? Did you forget the duname, the all-authority God who dwells in you? So not only do you engage the battle and say, I'm going to fight against my flesh. I'm going to fight against the ways of the world. I'm going to fight against my enemy when he comes. But I'm going to do it with confidence yes. because I know who lives in me and he's already overcome all three. And although maybe it's not working out perfectly right now in me, I am going with great confidence to believe that he is able while I fight this battle. I had somebody come to the church and we, they did a, a conference and one of the things I loved at the conference was, man, I said, I'm really growing. I said something to this effect. I'm really learning to grow in my affection for Jesus. And he's like, yeah, that's great. Here's, here's the deal. Are you growing in your confidence for Jesus? And the answer was no. It was like, I love you, Jesus, but I'm just, I don't really know that you got this. And he's like, what I'm trying to do is help people grow in their confidence in Christ. And one of the very practical ways, if you want to grow in confidence in Christ, you, want, you, want to, you, you need to do a, a, a pre-praise. Do you know what pre-praise is? A lot of us praise after God does something super awesome. We're like, God, you're awesome. I love how you brought healing. I love how you brought provision. Pre-praise is when you still need the healing and you still need the provision and you're like, God, you are awesome in all these things. And I trust you before you show up. I'm just gonna praise you. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna praise you that you are a healer, that you are a provider. I'm going to just walk in faith that you're going to be good no matter what, and I'm just going to give you praise now. Did a three-day journey, or I did a three-day journal in the U version of 
called Victory by Hillsong Worship. Super encouraging in that. Third one. Today is the day to take control of your thoughts. Today is the day to take control of your thoughts. I'm listening to a book right now by Jeannie Allen, the, the founder in, of If, and she's got this phrase, you have a choice. When those spiraling thoughts come, you have a choice. The Bible says, talks about renewing your mind. I want to invite you today to join God in the renewing of your mind, recognizing when those triggers of doubt and anxiety come up, and turning them over to Jesus and waiting on the Lord. Finally, today is the day to call upon the name of the Lord. To call upon the name of the Lord. There is power when we call upon the name of the Lord. Not that the, 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 some mysterious thing happens, but when we call upon the name of the Lord, we're calling upon the person of Christ. That's what we're going to do now. As we head to communion and as we sing, the communion table is set for us. And what communion is, is it's time to reflect. It's a time for us to think about what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. Jesus, on the night before he was betrayed, he uh, took the cup and he took the bread. and He said these were going to be things that, that would remind people of what he was about to do, his, his death, and then obviously his resurrection, which went along with it. And so communion for us is a time to be spiritually nourished. It is a time to remember, but today we're also going to use it as a time to call upon the Lord. Jesus, we're calling upon you and your power as we partake in this moment to nourish us and to empower us in ways that we've never been empowered before. And as we partake, I just want to encourage you to let this moment be something that resounds within you throughout your day where you become more and more accustomed to calling upon the name of the Lord throughout the day when your enemies arise rather than just the one moment on a Sunday. Now communion is for any believer in Christ who's come to, again, the end of themselves and trusted Christ and his completed sacrifice for them. And the scripture gives us uh, details as to how we're supposed to take communion. We're supposed to examine ourselves first and not take it in an unworthy manner. And what we believe that to mean is we're supposed to look at our lives and, and see, hey, first of all, are we a believer? Have we trusted Christ as our Savior? And, and number two, um, is there any area in our life where we're, we're holding back from God or where we've made peace with sin? And if there is, then now would be the time before you come to repent and, and like surrender that area and say, God, no longer will I remain hard in this area that is clearly against your design. Or if you're not ready to do that, then, then our invitation is to let the communion moment pass and ask God to soften your heart. But if you find yourself like, like I do, in desperate need of Jesus to be Jesus and, and looking to him to be the God of the Bible, the God of the dunamis, both to come and now, then come and be nourished by this communion moment. You'll hear a song over you and then uh, I'll, we'll come together and, and we'll all partake together. So there's a, there's a place to come and receive communion here and uh, there's, there's some in the back. And we just ask that you would come when you're ready and take the juice and take the cracker and hold it until we come back up and we'll all take together. Turn it over to the worship team now. On that same night, he took the cup and he poured it out. He said, as, as I pour this out, it's to remind you of how my blood will be poured out 
for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. And Paul in the New Testament says that when we, when we take communion, it not only reminds us, but it also um, helps us to look forward to his coming again. And so what we're going to do now, and we got about four minutes left, and so what we're going to do now is, is we're going to call on the name of the Lord. It's that, last, it's that last encouragement that I gave to you. We're going to call on the name of the Lord, and, and it's something that we do um, throughout the day. You have access to this power as you call on the person of Jesus. As you face your enemies throughout the day, you call on Jesus. As you enter your home, you call on Jesus. As you go into work, you call on Jesus. When that temptation calls and, and, you're, and it, it just, it's got your name, you call on the name of the duname that lives within you. You call on that name and you just say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. But then there's also, the, as, as Eugene Peterson says, the strategy to interrupt our preoccupation with self is, is worship. And so we're going to spend our last few minutes just in worship, talking about the, the victory that is Jesus who lives within us. Amen? So let's just have that strategic calling upon the name of the Lord as the body of Christ for the next three, four minutes. Let's go. Let's go.